Hey guys, how's it going? So today I really wanted to talk about capitalism, democratic socialism, and socialism as distinct different, well, as distinct ideas. So very briefly, capitalism is essentially the idea that the individual should be able to <clears throat> earn money, right? It's all about individual rights, individual freedoms. Um, everyone has value to a large extent. It's um, very sort of individualistic and essentially it means that the hardest working people can um, contribute maximally to the benefit of society and they can be financially rewarded for doing so. So they might start companies, they might, um, I don't know, become doctors, they might train for years to become doctors and a lot of this um, is based around the idea that people can, you know, make a profit and they can better their lives essentially so that's capitalism in a nutshell move on to um democratic socialism this is very popular with bernie sanders for example in america and essentially what they advocate is for capitalism but with really really high government spending so for example bernie sanders wants to um spend a lot more on um nationalizing healthcare and various things for that um they're generally um kind of a bit pro worker but they're kind of quite middle class or they tend to be and um i'm not saying that's necessarily bad to be middle class but they're kind of still capitalist but they just believe in higher government spending and now let's talk about the real socialists so real socialists basically believe that society should be run for the benefit of the majority of the people and they don't so much care about individuals um they care more about the fact that the group should benefit from any kind of activity that is done um, and uh, they basically believe that the means of production should be owned by the government slash workers and the two are kind of often um, the same in their eyes so yeah workers should work in collective farms where um, the collective farm would decide what they want to do um, <clears throat> so essentially you um, empower like um the workers and you kind of get rid of the capitalists and everything is run by the state very very bureaucratic it tends to be um so i, I guess that's um socialism in a nutshell and i have studied it quite a bit over the years and it's um certainly an interesting idea but i wonder if it's a bit outdated um nowadays because um capitalism has delivered so much to so many people Honestly, and I'm going to go on to a lot of this in the video, so um, yes, stay tuned. So I've got a series of questions, and I want to basically answer these questions to build up a bit of a case why I think capitalism is the best system. And okay, I guess let's just jump in. So is profit unjust? So I've heard a lot of anarchists and socialists and people sort of saying that profit is evil why should we um allow companies or even individuals to profit well on a biological level right if you expend more energy right than you get from let's say you want to um crawl on your hands and knees to mcdonald's and it costs you a thousand calories um and you're going to eat 500 calories worth of food whilst you're there well you've kind of got a deficit of 500 calories right and if you do that every single day of your life, for example, well, there's a big problem, right? Because, you know, you've got more calories going out than are coming in. So essentially that means that you, you're not making any profit there and you're going to die, basically, if you don't get enough calories over a very long period of time. So there's nothing very, very bad about profit, essentially. So what about profit in the workplace, for example? Um why why would a company need profit well companies need money basically to grow and to expand and for just everyday things right so let's say the company is um awarded a big project and it needs to buy in a load of stuff right it needs some kind of money lying around that it can kind of use to actually um buy the stuff for the project for example um companies need money to function and that money is sort of generated through profit okay generally speaking so is profit unjust no um profit is actually a sign that you are doing something right okay so if a company is making a great deal of profit it generally means that the um 
company is adding a great deal of value to their customers, right? And the customers are rewarding them with quite a quite a decent amount of money and the company's making a big profit, right? It means they're a very efficient company and generally it's a very good thing. So yeah, profit is a measure of success and I don't think it's at all unjust. So this is a strange one that I've heard quite a few times. Um, advocated by perhaps people who haven't been thinking very deeply about economics, but uh, some people think that workers should be paid 100% of what they produce, also known as the surplus labour. So the theory goes that there are all 100 employees and um, they're basically being paid 80% of what they're worth and all the extra money is going to the CEO and the CEO's got a Monopoly hat on and he's got a monocle and he's sitting around thinking, oh, I'm so rich because of all the exploitation of the workers. Um, and, you know, isn't this great? And he's smoking a cigar maybe. And, you know, the socialists come along and go, you should pay all your workers 100% of the value they produce, right? Now, of course, this is um, perhaps a bit silly, right? For a start, CEOs, right, are generally employees just like everyone else, okay? They're generally employed by the customer and by the board, for example, and the shareholders. So, again, the CEOs are actually being employed. They're not sitting around with smoking cigars in the top hats with their monocles. They're actually working really, really hard. Um, I think the average is about 70 or 80 hours a week for a lot of FTSE 250 um, CEOs and things. So... They, that first part is kind of ridiculous. Secondly, that kind of scenario kind of assumes that the workers are producing some kind of physical value. Well, quite often, they're not. And I'll give you an example. Um, if you carry round bits of wood in a forest, right, no one's going to pay you. But if you carry round plates in a restaurant, then, you know, you could well be paid for that. And you might be paid, um, you know, fairly decent wages or whatever, or maybe not. But nevertheless, your the fact the value is created by the team, right? So the person carrying around plates relies on the fact that the building, the, the rent for the building has been paid, um, that there's a chef in the kitchen, that there's a manager sort of looking after all the books, that maybe there's um, a CEO who initially, let's say they're the majority owner, they might have initially put in two million pounds into the business to start the restaurant, right? So the person sort of carrying the plates around, it, which is a necessary job, right? Don't get me wrong. It is an important and necessary job for the functioning of the restaurant. They are dependent on everyone else in order to um, basically bring money home. Um, so the idea that the CEO doesn't deserve to make any kind of money, right? It kind of doesn't really make sense, right? Because again, if a server created, let's say, um, 300 pounds of value a night okay carrying plates around then if they're paid 300 pounds a night and everybody else in the business is also paid um then there will be exactly no profit and it would kind of mean that some um, the business couldn't function for very long and eventually everyone would lose their jobs because there would be no money you know why would anyone kind of operate in that system it's um again it comes back to profit if the company isn't making a profit then it can't grow, it can't expand, it can't um, pay the people who put the money in initially, um, who are going to basically want to return on their money, because who's going to put money into a business if they don't get anything back from it? I mean, um, a lot of investors don't do it out of the goodness of their hearts. Some do. There are angel investors who might put money into a theatre production or something, but they're not the norm, basically. And even if they were the norm, they would very quickly be bankrupt if they couldn't make any money. So, okay, I hope that um, answers that. So, another problem with socialism is what it essentially does is it puts all the power into the hands of the state, okay? So, in a democracy, or in a capitalist system, rather, um, obviously, the CEOs and the um, shareholders they've got quite a lot of power, you know, they've got quite a lot of money, they can buy whatever they want, they can hire people, they, they've got a lot of power, right? But in a socialist system where the government owns everything, all the power is in the hands of the government. Now, there's lots and lots of problems with this because power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. You know, these are um, 
<clears throat> hard and fast rules, so you're always going to get a certain amount of um, corruption and, you know, misuse of power. Um, and even if you didn't, it's um, not ideal to put all the power in the hands of a tiny elite, right? I thought that's what socialists were against, but nevertheless, this is what always seems to happen whenever you have a socialist system. It's best to leave the power in the hands of the individual. Now, the we've talked about the CEOs having power and stuff. Yeah, they can they can make decisions. They can decide who they should hire, what the policy should be, um, what the company should produce, and everything else. Um, but also there's a lot of power in the hands of a consumer. So me, as a consumer, I can go shopping and I can buy anything I want from any shop, right? And that gives me a lot of power, right? So for example, let's say um, I really care about animal welfare, which I do. Um, if I'm gonna buy makeup, I might look for makeup which hasn't been tested on animals, for example. And this is an example of consumer power and I think it's great. I don't think you should strip it away from people and put all the power in the hands of the bureaucrats. Um, okay, so I'm going to come on to this topic again. But um, should the workers own the means of production? Um, so an example might be collective farms. So I was going to talk about Russia here briefly. So basically what happened is um, when the Tsars sort of... Um, fell right there was a sort of um brief period in russia where a lot of people actually could earn money freely and a lot of the peasant farmers right they're kind of called the kulaks right they um basically were really good farmers and they employed other people on the farms and they earned some money and it was kind of great because they were producing food that people wanted to buy and they became a little bit wealthy you know, maybe they would own a cow or a sheep or a goat or something or, you know, so we're not talking about wealthy by our standards, but nevertheless, these kulaks were relatively wealthy. And then the communists came along and said, look at these disgusting kulaks. They're making money and let's go and exterminate them and redistribute the money to the people um, because obviously the people are being robbed. Um, so what do you think happened? Well, all the kulaks were um, basically killed. So people went around all the different villages and towns and they'll, they said to the people, hey, um, who's the wicked capitalist around here? And everyone pointed to the guy with the goat because he's, you know, he's doing all right. He's employing other people. He's being productive. He's producing food. He's producing profit. Oh, gosh. So, yeah, all these um, poor peasant farmers who earn a bit of money were exterminated, right? And guess what happened? Well, they adopted a lot of um, collectivist farms, which weren't particularly productive or effective, and millions of people starved. So you essentially moved from um, a system of, um, I suppose, basic capitalism, where people could make a basic amount of money, and they could expand and they could produce more food, to a system of state control, um, and after a lot of murder, and a lot of people died. Now, one of the reasons why the um, Kulaks produced so much food and were so successful comes down to the Pareto Principle, which I'm going to come back to later on. But, um, nevertheless, there was a document which I saw a while ago, which um, was released by the Chinese government many, many years ago, but basically looked at the um, amount of food private farms versus collective farms produced, and they said, wow, private farms produce so much more food, you know, we're going to have to um, move to a sort of um, freer system, which they did under Dao Jepeng, and probably pronouncing that wrong, but um, yeah, they started producing so much more food when they went private um, and allowed people to actually farm for themselves instead of having these sort of state-run collective farms. So anyway, terrible tragedy. 100 million people died under sort of socialism slash communism, and it's absolutely disgusting. And honestly, if you look into this for any amount of time, you end up feeling revolted and sick that human beings could treat each other like that. <sighs> but that's the ideology. The ideology is if you murder the right people or get rid of them or whatever, then you'll create a paradise on Earth because these people are oppressing everyone else. So... Like I say, in Russia it was for Kulaks, as well as Ukrainians and a whole bunch of other people. In Cambodia, it was anyone who wore glasses, or anyone with soft hands, or anyone who was educated who was murdered. Um, 
generally speaking, this is um, kind of an extreme form of socialism slash communism. Um, and I just, I'll briefly cover the difference, but nevertheless, it was freaking awful. It was just disgusting. You know, you only have to look at the um, people who died, the, the men, women, and children, to kind of realise that this is evil, essentially. And uh, this is something that we should never really return to because it didn't work. And thank God for democratic socialists who can kind of say, well, we believe in slightly more state funding, right? Because yeah, they've diverted people away from actual socialism, which is pretty wicked and just impoverished huge numbers of people. So um, that kind of covers should the workers own the means of production. No, they shouldn't. Individuals who are the best and the brightest and the hardest working and who just are more successful in the market should own the means of production because they're the people who produce the food that feeds everyone. Just going back to the Kulak example. But yeah. Um, so I also want to say that if you ask someone of someone from 1900 um, what a communist utopia would look like, we're basically living in it, right? Oh my goodness, we are living in it. So for a start in 1900, 15%, uh, sorry, 50% of children under the age of five died for a start. So that's pretty freaking awful, right? They didn't have electricity. Um, the people didn't have like refrigeration. They didn't have medicine or antibiotics. They, um, they didn't have much money um, at all. You know, they were um, very, very poor. Um, they didn't have many they might have had some rights, um, especially in the um, UK, for example. But, you know, people were, um, their toilets were outside and um, it was just generally not very nice. Um, and if they could see what we have now, all these amazing state benefits, um, nationalised healthcare or even affordable healthcare in, you know, if you look at America or whatever, you've got Obamacare. Um, we, we live in unbelievable luxury. You know, we've got indoor plumbing. We can turn on the tap and hot water comes out. You know, we um, we can... The, the average American today has the equivalent of 250 slaves worth of energy, right? Um, so if you look at the total output of a um, human being, right, the energy output, then, yeah, we've got about 250 slaves, essentially. So... Um, you might get in your car and you can drive to the other side of a country right now for very little money, relatively speaking. Now, if you had to get one of your friends to pull you in a car to the other side of a country, they're going to want an awful lot more money than the car's going to demand in petrol, right? So yeah, we are living in absolute, complete luxury. You know, child mortality is incredibly low in the West. Um, we, we just um, generally... Um, very very well off and you know compared to um, what we used to have you know we're doing amazingly well you know even the king could have died of an infected toenail um, a few hundred years ago because they didn't have the medicine the pelicinin they didn't have the knowledge and a lot of this knowledge has been sort of created by about a thousand people in history okay a lot of the great advances has come down to about a thousand people um, and they deserve a video of their own so I will um make one um in the future but um yeah we are just doing unbelievably well um essentially i mean even the poor people um benefit from the benefit from society so for example in the uk poor people have access to the nhs to healthcare to all kinds of services to um some legal services for example and yeah there's more that we could do and of course we're not um anywhere near a sort of utopia because our standards have changed but nevertheless the problems that Marx described about people not having enough bread we've in the whole world right the um, average age that people get to worldwide is about 82 nowadays isn't that phenomenal the average age on planet earth is 82 if you went back 100 years in the UK you might see that the um, like average life expectancy that's what I meant the average life expectancy was under 40 in every country in the world in 1900, right? So, yeah, we've made massive strides forward and a lot of this is down to technology and innovation and, to a large extent, capitalism because if you concentrate all the power in the hands of a tiny minority, you're going to really, really, really discourage 
people from doing like research or you know trying to make their lives better or whatever it is um it, it's just generally better when people are free to do what they want in society that's another large part of capitalism is um and like liberal values is self-ownership right i own myself i'm not owned by the state i'm not owned by other people i'm oh i own myself right another fantastic innovation that's come along from sort of liberal capitalist philosophy from the west and it works really beautifully um okay so state spending as a percentage of gdp has risen over time maybe marx was right so again um building on the previous point if you look at state spending over time um pre second world war and first world war state spending was very very low then we have the first and second world wars and state spending rose massively um as a percentage of GDP, obviously because we wanted to win the war and the government needed money to um, win the war essentially. But after the war wars ended, the um, state spending stayed higher, right? So in the UK we got the NHS and a lot of the extra money went into the uh, NHS. In America they kind of kept um, a relatively large army and sort of other things too, so a lot of money went to um, soldiers and um, essentially we have massive states and they are just continuing to increase in size so you look at america they recently got obamacare which okay it was under obama but nevertheless the republicans haven't repealed that but again that was an increase in um overall state spending and if you look at what a what a lot of the um like people want to do now in america they want to adopt european style um social democratic programs like for example um nationalizing um things like healthcare so uh maybe marx was right in the sense that he said eventually free democratic nations would become kind of socialist slash communist in nature over time as the government kind of keeps expanding it's um the amount of money it's getting in um is this a good thing well this is the next question um seen an unforeseen value or i should say unseen value so there's this um, capitalist idea that if someone smashes a window, then they have to, well, I would have to spend, let's say a thousand pounds fixing the window, replacing the pane of glass, and that creates economic growth. Well, that's not strictly true. Some economists might believe that, but what's essentially happened is I have had to sacrifice a thousand pounds of my money in order to fix the window, but um, what they are not looking at is the unseen value, right? So if I didn't have to spend a thousand pounds on the window, maybe I would spend a thousand pounds somewhere else. And I probably would, to be honest. I would uh, maybe spend it on a holiday, or maybe I would spend it on um, starting a business, hypothetically, in the future. Or I would um, basically spend the unforeseen money on something else. This is another month problem with... Um, social democracy and also um so sorry democratic socialism as well as socialism um all the unforeseen money right and i'll just give you a quick example okay um a lot of people in america and the uk give a lot of money to charities okay and these charities do a great deal of good and you could almost argue they do as much good as the state if not more um, because, um, well, for a start, we decide where the money should go to which charity, for example. Um, so there's arguments that said if we had to pay less money in taxes to the government, we would have more money. We might actually spend more money on charity, for example, or we might spend more money on the things we want and that will kind of feed back into the economy and um, it will actually employ more people and sort of create economic growth, right? So the tax that you take from people could actually be spent better by the people themselves on the things that they actually want to spend it on um if i had to choose between giving money to a charity i believed in or giving money to the government i'd rather the money went to the charity to be honest but it isn't always binary choice anyway this is another problem with um socialism because socialism takes money from people and redistributes it in various ways which you know kind of works in every single capitalist country pretty much in the world um 
to some extent. And like I say, the amount of money that the government is extracting from people has been going up a lot. Now, the amount of money earned by, let's say, the um, top 1% or the top 10% has been going up and up and up too. But they also pay, um, I, think it's, I think the top 1% pay about 40% of the tax in the UK or something. Uh, I'll get you the statistics. But nevertheless, the people who earn a lot more money pay a lot more tax. So um, maybe that's the way it should be. But at least we allow them to earn the money in the first place. If we said to them, sorry, you're not allowed to earn that money anymore. You can, um, you know, here's your grub. Here's your um, bread. Now go work in that factory or something. Because, you know, your um, socialist overlord over here has sort of decided that you should be a factory worker or whatever. Well, they're not going to actually innovate and um, produce what they could potentially produce. Um, so there's a saying that <clears throat> they don't really... Um, what's the saying? Um, I don't really care about the dimensions of Einstein's brain. But what I do care about is the fact that there's probably been a peasant farmer who was spent their whole life working in a field who could have been just as big, if not bigger, than Einstein, okay? Um, now, this is a massive argument for capitalism, right? Because that peasant farmer in a sort of capitalist system will generally get a good education, um, will generally be able to um, achieve um, a lot more. You know, they'll, they'll basically have self-ownership. So if they want to try their hand at um, being the next Einstein or something, you know, they'll have that option far more than if they're sort of forced into being a peasant farmer and sorry we think that you're a good peasant farmer you just have to um work in the state farm for you for your entire life or whatever um anyway i'm slightly getting off the point um let's move on to the next one why should we reward capitalists um okay so we should essentially reward capitalists because like i said initially profit is a sign of success and if a lot of people will take risks in starting a company because they ultimately know that they can um, enrich themselves and their grandkids and they can make a better life for themselves and everyone else um, and they'll, they're willing to take that risk because it'll um, make them better off um, at the end of it so if you take away all the um, economic incentives for them to actually work hard and to be really really successful in that regard they're probably not going to, you know, be successful. You know, if they can um, get a job sweeping the floor in the factory for um, five hours a week or something, and they're still going to get the same amount of um, goods and services as someone who's working 70 hours a week, they would be an absolute idiot to work 70 hours a week when, you know, they get the same amount of rewards for sweeping the floor. Um, and that is another problem with socialism. Um, so I heard about a um, socialist country, and um, so Marx, let's go back to Marx. Marx kind of dreamed of a country where, um, for example, a brain surgeon could come into the hospital in the morning, and he could do some surgery um, in the morning, and then maybe in the afternoon he's had enough of the surgery, so he's going to go fishing, and um, then maybe he's going to go work on the farm for a bit. So. You know, this is the kind of utopia Marx wanted, you know, one where work wasn't boring and monotonous anymore, but it was kind of fun and you could do whatever you want whenever you wanted to, um, essentially. Now, there's a lot of problems with this. For a start, if you want to train a surgeon, right, you really need a surgeon who's um, very, very committed, right? Um, they probably need like 20 years of education, say, or 25 years of education, maybe, you know, from the age of four onwards or five onwards. Um, so creating a surgeon is incredibly costly to society. Um, and you could say, well, they have to pay for it all themselves. But no, the state's paying for a lot of their education currently. Um, or maybe it's not. Maybe they go to private schools. But anyhow, um, it's still incredibly expensive, no matter what, for society to create a surgeon. And if a surgeon's only going to be a surgeon for, say, 10 hours a week, right, then for a start, they're not going to be a very good surgeon because they're not going to have the skills necessary in order to be um, a good surgeon. So um, what you need to really do is you need to say, right, um, we're going to give you a big financial reward for being a surgeon and also a lot of social acolytes, right? So, you know, you get the um, title of MD, for example, and, you know, there's a lot of potential 
um, career progression and you know you can do a lot of social good obviously by saving lives and that sort of thing um, but nevertheless um, if you just said to him right you can spend half your day fishing that's not a very good use of 25 years investment for someone to go out and do fishing um, again I do advocate self ownership here but in a capitalist society if you're a surgeon then you've got a so you've kind of um sort of made a commitment to um you know do a bit of surgery basically now and again because what's the point of becoming a really you know great surgeon if you're not going to actually help anyone or save any lives you know it's a bit pointless um or you're gonna spend half your day fishing um so yeah capitalism can kind of help everyone so again um there's been about a thousand innovations right which have massively made our lives better um, f throughout let's say the last 200 years and they deserve a video of their own so I will make one at some stage but nevertheless right um, a thousand sort of people have created so much and improved our lives so massively um, you know we, we kind of take it for granted yeah but um, if there's a capitalist and they start producing a product what they're essentially doing, and maybe they employ a load of people to do it, what they're essentially doing is creating wealth. Um, so the product will be sold on the market, people can buy the product, and you know maybe because it's mass produced it will be relatively cheap. So the work of um, capitalists makes everyone else richer essentially. So a good example might be laptops for example. Um, there's a huge amount of um, stuff that goes into a laptop right probably um it takes a million people to build a laptop right that might sound like stupid why would it take a million people to build a laptop well you need a whole global infrastructure for a start to transport the laptops around the world um secondly you need let's say oil from saudi arabia you might need um rare earth minerals like lithium from um inner mongolia you might need um i don't know microchips from germany um, maybe you need some, um, I don't know, technology that um, exists in, you know, Great Britain. Um, again, you might need some, you know, expertise from America or or whatever. And you literally need hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different elements to come together. Hundreds of different computer programs, right, that all contribute to the operating system. Um, and all of this needs to sort of come together. And if you look to everyone who was involved in making a laptop, right, then again it wouldn't surprise me if there were sort of millions of people involved at some stage or another um so the guys who are extracting the lithium need to eat so people need to feed them right and they need houses so people need to build houses for the people who are extracting lithium and you know you can kind of see you need a whole economy to produce a single good and this whole this only works right because um of capitalism because okay let's say um you've got instead of having ceos who are kind of responsible for running an individual piece of the economy like the mine that extracts the lithium right there's um a guy running it or um maybe a woman running it and uh she um is basically really 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 good at her job and um she's you know driving up efficiency she's investing in new technologies to extract more lithium you know um basically she has got a lot of um, power over how that mine is run um, and she can run it really really well because um, she's got a proven track record um, the people who um, kind of initially put the money in to extract the uh, lithium they're kind of backing her and they're saying she's great and you know she's probably earning like a fairly decent amount of money let's you know let's be frank because she's got the skills in order to make the business successful um, if you kind of got rid of her and say right we don't need you anymore because we've got a bureaucrat in the government and the bureaucrat is going to run the lithium mine and he's going to run the mine over here and he's going to run this factory and he's going to run that factory over there um and he's going to run like i don't know hundreds and hundreds of businesses right that is um kind of stupid but this is the reason why the um soviet system why the socialist system couldn't even feed everyone they couldn't even stock the supermarkets because instead of having millions of leaders they had like one guy right who um, would run this whole area of stuff right capitalism basically 
um, is the best way of finding the best people for running various parts of the economy and um, it works beautifully well. Um, so it's about decentralized power. Instead of putting all the power in the state and the bureaucrats, the power goes to the people and we've got a sort of meritocracy to a large extent for people that are super productive, um, can contribute maximally to creating this amazing system and the people who maybe aren't so productive can still possibly find um, jobs and you know various things like that. Um, and again, this all this kind of comes back to the Pareto principle, but I, I will explain that later on. <clears throat> so that's capitalism has helped us all. Um, so some people say we need socialism because it it's good for the environment, right? Um, now these tend to be more on the democratic socialist scale. And they're basically calling for more government regulations on things. Um, maybe, maybe we need more um, regulations on um, on things like um, the environment. I mean, it certainly wouldn't hurt if um, America had a few more sort of regulations on things like shale. Um, the American government decided that shale was going to be exempt from any kind of um, government regulations in regards to um, oil spills or um, you know any kind of leaks or anything. So. Yeah, um, they've kind of got us. They've kind of got a point, but if you look at actual socialist countries, they were freaking terrible for the environment. Absolutely devastating, right? Um, the um, there was an absolutely horrendous ecological um, ecological damage done by um, let's say um, <clears throat> socialist China and. Um, socialist Russia, for example, you know, huge amounts of um, damage done. And again, look at um, China, which is still has a lot of elements of um, socialism or communism. You know, they're still run by the Communist Party. Um, there's still a hell of a lot of state control over everything. Um, they are producing, what, two and a half times more pollution than America, I think it is. I'd have to look it up. But, you know, they socialism, there's nothing clean about it necessarily. What seems to work really well is where you've got um, a government which will make um, fairly tight um, like regulations and then you've got private companies who can kind of almost work with the government who can um, you know follow these environmental you know regulations and um, look companies want to make money and they want to be clean and they want to be ethical because it increases their sales right who are you going to buy like I say um, a product from a, um, a carbon neutral company or a company that produces loads and loads of carbon, you know? It's kind of in their interest to um, be um, environmentally friendly as possible, right? Um, so, yeah, um, I still think that um, there's no good argument for socialism in regards to environmentalism, but I can see why government regulations and things like that might actually help. But then again, it's a bit problematic because um, if you look at the car industry, um, they were quite tight regulations in the European Union about how much um, pollution these cars could produce and nearly all the companies it was discovered were kind of swing yeah um they were just misreporting the amount of um, pollution that their cars produced you know this was um, a really big scandal really um nearly all the car companies were lying and it sort of looked to me like the um, European Union didn't like the American car industry so they put really really high environmental standards on European cars right and all the European car companies just lied about it and this was just a way of screwing over the Americans by banning the sale of their cars in Europe because heck they're making too much pollution even though European cars were making just as much pollution and just lying about it um, and look there's a big amount there's a big difference between how much pollution a car makes on the road and if you um, suspend a car like in the air and you know you attach something to the funnel I and mean, then you measure the emissions that way there are big differences so yeah it's it's complicated but i certainly don't see um socialism as a good way of improving the environment if anything it damaged the environment um there are more trees now in the in the northern hemisphere than there were was um 50 years ago by quite a big margin and um okay you could say um burning coal is evil and wicked maybe it is maybe we should be burning natural gas or you know using more in renewables and things certainly in favor of that but um 
the burning of coal did save a lot of trees, you know, and trees take in a lot of carbon, obviously. So it sort of swings and roundabouts. It's not an easy problem to solve. And if you look at what happened in Germany, Germany started um, using way more new renewables after Fukushima, they shut down all their nuclear plants, right? And what Germany have ended up doing is producing more emissions, right? A lot more emissions because they're having to use their coal powered um, power plants in order to supplement the power because um, the sun doesn't shine at night. So if you're heavily dependent on solar panels, then um, you've got to get the energy up from somewhere. And if you don't want to use nuclear, um, nuclear is good, but it's really expensive and we don't really know what to do with waste. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, Germany just ended up being less environmentally friendly because they pursued renewables very, very heavily. A brief word on um, communist China. I don't know if you guys know what's happening in communist China these days, um, but let's just say that the Uyghur people, um, who are sort of Muslims, are being held in concentration camps and this is absolutely disgusting, kind of reminds me of the um, stuff that happened previously under communism and I suppose to a lesser extent in Nazi Germany, but the um, women seem to be sterilized and the kids are being put into re-education camps um, to turn them into little model Chinese citizens. So yeah, it's um, by the international definitions, the um, they're, they're being genocided, you know, um, they're being wiped out culturally and they're being prevented from having kids. So yeah, pretty freaking terrible. And they've um, got this um, new system that basically tracks everyone in the country. And if you are not, if you're not happy about the Chinese government, for example, then you will be prevented from traveling. You know, they might fire you from your job. You'll be socially ostracized. <clears throat> so yeah, it's a real horrendous mess in um, China, and it's become really like authoritarian. You know, the President Ping is, um, I think it's President Ping, he's declared himself president for life. Um, so yeah, it's um, really, really messy. And of course, they uh, don't have free and fair, free and fair um, elections, right? They've got the Communist Party for life. Um, and okay, I realize a lot of people will say, I like socialism, but I don't like the Chinese or whatever, or the Chinese system. Well, what aspects do you like? All these different countries, right, that have adopted the, China, the sort of socialist model, and all of a sudden you say, well, I don't really like um, Nigeria or whatever, because Nigeria went quite communist a while ago. I don't really like um, Cuba, um, or I don't really like the Soviet Union, or I don't really like Stalin. Well, what do you like? Again, I think a lot of democratic socialists are just kind of being edgy and they just want a bit more spending in the capitalist economy. Fine. <sighs> okay, so on the point of environmentalism, if you raise someone's yearly income to £5,000 a year, it makes them care far more about the environment. Okay, now, if you look at some... Um, plastics in the ocean, right? Everyone's going on about plastics in the ocean because it's terrible. It's killing a lot of the um, fish life and stuff and it's kind of disgusting that, um, you know, we're flooding the um, ocean with these plastics that are basically going to, you know, float there for the next thousand years or something. Um, nearly all of the um, pollution in the oceans, the plastic pollution and things, are coming from Asia and Africa and it's mostly Asia. Now, you could say, well, um, what's the solution here? Well, perhaps the solution is to actually um, implement more capitalism, right? Make the people richer, um, get good proper waste disposal services, right? Um, improve the air quality. If people are earning about $5,000 a, um, a year, right? Then they start to care a lot more about the environment because they have food and possibly shelter, right? So they're not starving and they've got somewhere to sleep. Of course, they're going to care about the environment more. You know, they want to kind of beautify the area. They want to improve the um, air quality. They want to, um, you know, put proper waste disposal and recycling plants in place, right? I actually think one of the things the West should be doing is building a lot more recycling plants in Asia so we can protect the sea and, um, you know, stop dumping so much stuff in the sea, generally speaking. And of course, the other thing is, if um, the West isn't entirely let off the hook here, a lot of um, waste is actually like um, dumped in 
poorer countries and it isn't disposed of particularly well so um good waste prevention programs are great you know less plastic waste um on the other hand there are problems with um like okay so if you look at the problems with um bags for example um a plastic bag right like a thin plastic bag takes almost no energy to produce right and you can produce billions of the bloody things and um if you look at the environmental damage that hessian bag causes um i think you would have to use um hessian bag for about 300 years to make it have the same environmental footprint as just using disposable cheap plastic bags so that's really really kind of strange and problematic but nevertheless um it sort of seems like the hessian bags um actually can cause a lot more environmental damage because you've got to grow the crop and you've got to you know weave it and you've got to do all this other stuff so um i don't think there are simple answers really um maybe we would have been better off sticking with um thinner plastic bags but maybe biodegrade or something you know because you do get biodegradable bags so maybe that would have been a better solution instead of um spending um so much extra energy and resources producing more expensive bags so yeah very very complicated really um cap i've already basically covered this one capitalism has millions millions of leaders um socialism might have let's say 250 leaders in the government right so i've already covered this point basically um every single person in a capitalist society can decide how their money is spent um we also tend to have democracy in capitalist countries and um generally speaking it's um it's just better for everyone but um everyone is kind of a leader so so for example like i can decide where my money goes i can decide what charity it goes to um or you know where i spend it i can spend it in if i want to um ethical shops that i agree with so for example the co-op is kind of um you know owned by the workers to some extent so i could spend my money there if i want to um but anyway i've basically covered that um so a lot of the FTSE 100 companies right these are the biggest companies in the uk um and this is also true in america they have their only um big companies for about 25 to 30 years so and then they kind of fall out of the FTSE 100 so it's not like the big companies that people have a go at are going to be big forever you know they generally shrink right so since 2000 since 1999 half of the FTSE 1 companies in the um half of the FTSE 100 companies have um basically gone out of the FTSE 100 and they've been replaced by other companies so this is healthy right companies can come along and they can produce a great deal of value to the end user and they can become very very wealthy and very very good at what they do and then they can kind of if they stop being so useful to society then they kind of sink back down again and or they might go bankrupt you know maybe they'll go bankrupt um there's this thing called a death spiral so okay um let's come on to the um Prato distribution a bit so in a workplace the Prato principle means for 80 percent of the responsibility and work are shouldered by only 20 percent of the employees right so what tends to happen is 20 percent of the employees are hyper productive and they'll produce 80 percent of the um well they're responsible for 80 percent of the work and responsibility but you don't know who these 20 percent are who are like hyper productive so a lot of big companies um what will happen is there'll be um, a downturn in the market and maybe they'll have to cut back on wages or something or maybe not but anyway for some reason a lot of the um hyper productive people will leave the company and the um company will sort of start a death spiral so all the productive people leave and then you're left with a lot of people who aren't as productive and that's um a huge problem because the company starts to go under basically and this is kind of why companies generally only stay in the FTSE 100 um again i think it might be 33 years in america i'm not sure but yeah they don't stick around for ages um if we had a socialist 
um, state, right? And we had um, large socialist institutions, right? Then they would never die because they are funded by the government and they employ people and they will just carry on forever. Even if they become like zombie companies that aren't really innovating or doing anything um, particularly useful, then they'll just carry on because they're funded by the state and they can't fail, right? There's no fail criteria. They don't even need to make a profit because the socialists have gotten rid of profit. So they're just organizations that are just basically zombies, right? Um, I remember her hearing about a Russian company and it went on for 35 years, I think it was, and it never made a profit. It just lost money every single year. And it just carried on like a zombie company. And I think it was in like um, oil and gas and minerals. But nevertheless, um, part of um, the power of capitalism is that the less productive organizations won't last. And the ones that are productive kind of um, will carry on, you know, producing stuff that people want and adding value to the world. So a little disclaimer at the end. Of course, I support um, a benevolent society that cares for its people, but socialism will prevent the hardest working and most competent people from actually flourishing. So what we kind of need is a capitalist society where the poorest people, um, or people are generally looked after, which is kind of what we have. Um, so I'm, I'm guessing I'm a kind of a status quo warrior. But <clears throat> when you talk about taking more and more and more money away from people or you know, you listen to Jeremy Corbyn going on about how rich people are wicked and evil and um, how, you know, the, the workers need more money or, or whatever it is. You sort of think, oh, God, really? If that's not what we want or that's not what we need. You know, what we need is a sort of um, better, fairer society that, yeah, looks after um, people who are less able to um, work or look after themselves. Sure, why not? I mean, we're very, very rich relatively speaking, in a historical context, but you also can't prevent people from um, being productive because that's how societies become, like, awful and less efficient and eventually fail. Thank you very much for uh, listening, guys, and I um, hope you found this useful. And, uh, yeah, speak to you soon. Okay, bye.